Hi everyone, welcome to March 900. I'm Mark and as you can probably tell from the muddy bike, the smashing pumpkins and general attire, it's now winter and today I want to talk about preparing for this coldest of seasons. Now you may remember that I did a two-parter on preparation for summer and it seemed to go down really well but that needed to cover off things like stripping down all the different parts of the bike so like the rear wheel came off, all the plastics and we got to all the dirt and road grime that had built up over the previous winter. I can honestly say that it was well worth doing and I was safe in the knowledge that my bike didn't have any lumps of salt corroding its way into the subframe and cleaning it was a doddle with just a quick spray of furniture polish and a light dusting. So in contrast, what do we need to do now that summer has ended and go into this next winter? Well, I don't need to start stripping down the bike to get rid of the summer, it just needs a quick wash and we will come back to that in just a bit. But firstly, let's talk about clothing. OK, I'm not going to go and tell you how to go and dress yourself, but I do have some top tips. If it's cold, then obviously put more clothes on or have a think about heated gear. Now, I got these last year. These are the RST Paragon 6 gloves. Uh, they've got batteries in the cuff and they can be charged up. They've got three heat settings and on the lowest heat setting, they can last up to like four hours. And I've got to say, these are an absolute game changer, particularly for those of us that don't enjoy heated grips on our bikes. Right then, in terms of waterproof, I'm going to be doing a video next week on how I got this old jacket a bit more waterproof. It's from that well-known brand, GMAC, and soaks up all the water and then pushes it straight onto my clothes. Well, who's ever heard of a GMAC? The other thing I have is this oversized waterproof, which is really cheap. It was about £10. I got it from Amazon, and I could even fold it up and put it in my underseat helmet storage. Now, usually it just sits in my backpack and I use it for those rainy rides home from work. So that's my waterproofs. Lastly, I'll just mention the good old helmet, and in particular the visor. So here's a quick story for you. This weekend, me and my mate Graham went out to recreate the journey that Henry Cole did on season 11, episode three of the motorbike show. And that was here in the UK. So he went from the oily rag in Gloucester up through the Malverns to Chelsea Walsh, which is a fabulous ride on the way up we stopped at British camp where we saw the most stunning bike. Now people were gathered around to look at this thing. It was actually a Royal Enfield. I don't know which one because I've never really been interested in Royal Enfields before and um, this one was just completely different. It was an absolute thing of beauty because it had been customised in all sorts of ways and it had been done so well. Now we ended up talking to the guy who owned it, a chap called Jez, and he was setting up his own customisation company called Wild Cog. And before you know it, he ended up joining us on our jaunt through the countryside. And isn't that the great thing about biking and meeting people? Back to the story, and uh, we set off, me, my mate Graham, and this other guy Jez, and uh, 10 minutes later, we started off in the sunshine, 10 minutes later, it was absolutely throwing it down in a way I've never seen from the position of a motorbike saddle. It was so hard that rain got stuck in between the visor and the pin lock. Now that trap water then heated up when the sun eventually came out and turned into steam. At this point, I couldn't see a thing. But anyway, enough of this sub story, the whole point of it is that what you need to do, make sure you check all your kit. You might have the right kit, but make sure it's got no rips and tears and make sure things like your helmet and that are functioning properly. Next up, let's talk about riding style. Again, I'm not going to tell you guys how to ride. And the one thing I noted on our wet trip this weekend is that whether you're on a Royal Enfield, an Africa Twin or a Z900, when the weather changes, you will need to change your riding style accordingly. And generally, we do that automatically because we have this built-in sense of survival. So there's not really that much I can tell you. But again, I do have some top tips. Now, besides the massive puddles of water mixed with a liberal helping of oil, the things to watch out for are leaves. Now, just take a look at this bit of film I made riding to work last week. And as you will see, all over the road are these leaves, which get wet and slimy, so they're about as grippy as a polished ice rink. Please watch out for them. There's loads of people on the forums talking about how they've been sent sideways by a few leaves on the road. And just to prove my point, I'll tell you that I was in my car yesterday and I pulled into that shop you see on the left-hand side there, and my anti-lock brakes came on just because I was slipping on the leaves. So this is going to continue for another month or so. Please do watch out for them. Now slowing down is clearly a great thing to do, but unfortunately it's a bit of a double-edged sword at times, as I found out during this very same ride that we're on right now. Now, as you can see, it's persisting down, and I'm doing well under 70 miles an hour. Firstly, because that's the speed limit, secondly, it's raining that hard, and finally, because I'm filming myself and putting it on YouTube for the Rosas to see me speeding in the rain is never a good thing, especially for my license. Now, here's the problem. 
This cockwomble comes flying past me in a Chelsea tractor and then proceeds to cut straight in front of me, causing me to slow down and spraying road water all over me, but all I can do is back off. All that to get a couple of metres in front and then he hits the brakes. What a dick. So just note that it's about adjusting your riding style to accommodate for the idiots as much as it is about slowing down. Right, let's move on to the bit you've all been waiting for and talk about the bike and all the things that we can do to it to help prepare ourselves for winter. Now, I'm afraid this is actually very unexciting. This is a modern Japanese bike. The parts are made of galvanised steel, aluminium, stainless steel and plastic. I could leave it out in the rain all week and it's not going to go rusty. So what do I really need to worry about? Well, it has to be the salt that we put on our roads, at least in the UK. One whiff of cold weather and the trucks are out spreading salt to prevent accidents and having the council sued for not looking after the roads properly. I guess it's generally a good thing, but when they put too much on a dry road, it can be as slippery for a bike as those wet leaves from earlier. The other problem is the corrosive properties of salt and water being flicked all over your bike. Now, I used to live near the sea and spent a lot of time on speedboats, so I know a little bit about how a boat engine sucks up seawater to cool the engine rather than circulating around a radiator. Now, for it to be able to do that, the engine has to be marinized, which means protected against the salt water. Also, the engines have sacrificial anodes which are stuck onto the engine and the chemical reaction with the salt causes them to degrade very quickly so that the engine doesn't get destroyed. Very clever, and has always made me wonder why we don't have them on the bottom of cars and on bikes. It does, however, tell us that salt will destroy your beautiful machine. So another quick story for you is about my mate at work and he's got this MT-07 which really is a lovely bike but he rode it all through the winter and he didn't wash it once. He just couldn't be bothered and this thing is now going rusty from top to bottom and let me tell you once these things start to rust there is no stopping them. One thing he does have though is a chain oiler so his chain's in immaculate condition and we always joke to him that actually he probably should have just bought an entire bike oiler. So what can we do to really protect our bikes from all this salt and all this corrosion? Well, you lucky people, you're going to get some more top tips. But just before I dive into that, let me apologise for the next minute or so. Um, the microphone quality is not that great because I've finally bought myself a radio mic and it's not quite as plug and play as I thought it was going to be. So um, just bear with it. Normal quality will be resumed shortly. Here we go then, just back off the commute on a standard winter's day. I do go down some mucky lanes, there's no uh, salt on the roads yet, but there is a lot of dirt, as you can see, both by my um, boots and by the bike. If we just zoom in, you can see there all the dirt up the front and the smell coming off those front pipes is absolutely disgusting. So um, there we go. I'll show you exactly what I do now when I come back off every single commute in the winter time. Okay, so I'm just lucky enough to have a hose pipe and an outside tap. Um, so what I do is get in there and just give it a swirl down every single time. I don't um, bother brushing it, sometimes I do. Try not to get it down the exhaust pipe and just get rid of all the horrible stuff on it. Now we've already established that water's not going to really hurt the bike, so I don't mind it getting wet with nice clean water, but all I want to do is get that muck off there and get a bit of steam off the front pipes. And I also try and get in the back of the radiator gently just to push any dirt back out of the radiator that might have got in there. And that is pretty much all I do. It only takes a few seconds and then I'll stick it away in the garage and once it's dried off I might have to stick a bit of oil on the chain but apart from that I'll leave it at that. So my Saturday mornings for the next few months are going to consist of me being out here cleaning my bike properly. Now, I've tried some of these products like these squirty things that you squirt on, you leave it for a few minutes and then you simply hose pipe it off and everything's good. Well, personally, I find they don't work very well. If anybody knows one that is good, then please let me know because I'm losing faith in those completely. Right then, what I tend to do is just have a bucket of hot soapy water. I've got a couple of different brushes which I use generally on the metal work. Um, around there so it doesn't scratch it and I've got that one which gets into all the difficult bits inside the wheels and then of course you've got your soft cloths normally I use a sponge but um, in this case I've got a couple of old dish cloths they're pretty um, pretty soft they're not going to scratch any of the paintwork particularly around the tank because the paint isn't that thick on these Kawasaki's as you probably know so you don't want to be getting on there with your brush and giving it a good scrub so once I've cleaned the bike and I've got all of the dirt and the grime off it I'm just left with a load of soap so I give that a swill off with a hose pipe which is nice and easy it's just like when I come back at the end of the day I don't bother brushing it it's just a case of getting all that soap off really more so that it will look nice and also I can get my chamois leather give it a ring out 
and then certainly on the paintwork in particular I'll give that a rub down with the chamois because that stops any nasty watermarks appearing once it's dry then I'll put the bike away and I'll get it out the next day and give it a coating of something just to help protect it so we'll come back to that one tomorrow okay so it's the next day and uh, sure enough it's raining again now whilst the bike was dry um, I managed to spray loads of ACF 50 all over it and then I got in there with a nice big clean wide um, very soft paintbrush which uh, only a cheap thing and I got in there uh, sprayed this on and then brushed it all in which works great now you can also buy those sprays as well obviously which you can just spray on like the muck off do a really nice one um, but in this case I just went with the ACF 50 so that should make the bike even more waterproof not that uh, I think it really had a problem with that and the other things it'll do is make the bike look really nice as well so uh, that's a good thing to do while well, we've got this sort of weather. Now just a couple of other things to talk about modifications very quickly while I get soaking wet. Now the first thing is that I put this um, thing on the back here, on the back of the number plate, which stops the water flicking up onto my back. Obviously I've chosen to fit a tail tidy and so I do have that problem of water flickage, uh, which this seems to solve really well. And I tried it last time, I made one of my own and just stuck it on, there's a video about that, but this is a proper one from Pyramid Plastics and we'll come back to those in just a minute. Um, the other thing that I've done is put this rear hugger extender on. That is absolutely brilliant at stopping the water from going into the back of the bike here where you've got loads of sort of brake pipes and the suspension and the chain and all that sort of stuff. So that, that really protects it well. Um, why they don't just make it that long in the first place is a mystery to me. I don't know. Um, but that's a good job. Again, pyramid plastics. We'll come back to it. And then on the front, I've literally just fitted this front um, mudguard extender, this front fender extender. This one is by um, Puig. Now I started off with Pyramid Plastics but that one as I say is Puig. Now the issue I've had with Pyramid Plastics is that this rear one, um, I'll show you a picture of it, isn't actually symmetrical and the reflector on it doesn't stick on very well either and it keeps moving around. So I'm not particularly pleased with that but that'll be getting ripped off in the summer anyway. Um, so this rear hugger extender also doesn't fit particularly well. There's gaps down the side of it that I'm not happy with. It just, it's not quite right. And I can't say I would recommend that one either. And the front one that I put on there was also a Pyramid Plastics one originally. You might remember that from a video last year. It was a disaster. I got in such a huff over it. I just chucked it out in the end. I tried to dremel bits off it and cut bits here and there and try and melt it. I just could not make it fit. Um, so I cannot say that I would recommend Pyramid Plastics in any way. But Puig, I've used for that one, which fits a treat. I've also bought screens before by Puig and I find them really good. And obviously you can spend a few more quid again and go to RNG and they make fantastic kit that just fits perfectly as well. But yeah, stay away from Pyramid Plastics if I was you. Well, that's about it from this winter edition in the rainy Cotswolds. The Z900 is now just about winterized and ready to go. In summary, I give it a good swirl down after every ride. I give it a good wash on the weekends. Then I put some ACF 50 or other motorcycle protectant on it. And in this case, I brush it in with a nice soft brush. It helps protect the bike, but also it makes it look really nice as well. Now, other hardware modifications you can do are these mudguard extenders, front and rear. And if you've got a tail tidy, something on the back. And personally, I think that's pretty much all you need to do with a bike to get it ready for the winter. Or at least a nice, well-made Z900 like this one. So that's it then. Just don't forget as well, also make sure you keep those chains oiled and I'll see you again soon.